Welcome back to the Injured Pro Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Evan Porter, Dr. Physical Therapy, Medical Analyst, FantasyPoints.com. Today, we have the great at Lord Reeves on Twitter or X. He's sharp football analysis, sharpest fantasy. Well, I don't want to say the sharpest. You're a sharp fantasy analyst, so I will say one of the sharpest in the industry. I don't want to compare you to your comrades over there at Sharp Football. That's not, you don't want to pit people against each other, Reeves. Okay. Life lesson don't pit people against each other. But you are one of the sharpest in the industry in general as a whole. I had a good time meeting you in person for the first time at the expo, had some good conversations, had perhaps a drink or seven, and it was a good time. But I always love having you on the show. Um, because I really appreciate your perspective on things. Your brain is huge. It hardly fits into all of your Cleveland Guardian caps that you have. And uh, show, can you show the, can you show for the, for the, uh, can you reach them the, the video audience? Dude, I can't I reach them right now. The ground because yeah. I'm trying to show them to you one at a time. He's got about a million of them and they all look the same. A slight different variation of the same hat, but they have different Rich colors. Rebar. And you got to, Shoes and <laughs> shoes and shirt, man. It's like, if you're from my era, your, your shoes and your shirt always match your hat. Is that what era are you from? I'm from, I think, just my era. I don't know, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Uh, That's yeah, how I no, grew I up, man. Everything matched. Right. Everything's got match. Everything matches. I really appreciate you coming on, man. Um, <laughs> make sure you follow him on Twitter or X, whatever, at Lord Reeves. And uh, make sure you check out the draft kit over at sharpanalysisfootball.com. Anything else, Rich? I mean, we can just side rail the show from the open and I can yeah. defend my Taco Bell take if you want. Oh, uh, God. Oh, uh, OK, no. So let's set this up. Right. So um, <laughs> there was a tweet. And at this point, it kind of doesn't matter what the tweet even was. I think I forgot because I was blinded by this take. Um, you know, Rich said he would eat a tweet if something happened. And <laughs> then so I put in a group chat that we're in in the injury prone invitational league. Uh, that he is barred from using his first round pick because he says that he likes Taco Bell seasoning and he likes Taco Bell in general. Listen, yeah, everybody's Taco had Taco Bell, Bell Rich. But I, I'm setting you up here. Defend yourself by saying that Taco Bell is one of the best, one of the best uh, dining experiences that it, an individual could have. Now you're putting words in my mouth. Now you're 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 uh, you're just taking a huge stretch here. So first of all, I am from an area that that has a lot of great Mexican food. I would choose it nine times out of 10 over Taco Bell. But everyone has done the Taco Bell guilty pleasure thing. They, they come up with new, they come up with a new product every week. It's the same ingredients as the last product, but it's a new product. And That's you got to, yep. you got to appreciate that kind of, that kind of hustle. But like Denny's or Waffle House, like it's a thing that's it's cheap and affordable and it's there. It's like if, you, if you're telling me that you've never get done like a, a Taco Bell bender, like you've either, you know, you've never been drinking or like never like found yourself in a situation where it's just like, you know, man, I got five bucks. I'm going to make this thing work. Uh, <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't defend it on the scale of quality. But as far as like guilty pleasures go, like everyone goes to Taco Bell. Absolutely. The only thing about Taco Bell is uh, the post Taco Bell uh, visit right. to uh, the little boys room, we'll say. Uh, it could be lengthy. It can be long. But at the time, you know what I like to do, Rich? I like to sit down. I like to, uh, after you know Taco Bell, I like to get my phone. I go to sharpfootballanalysis.com. I open the draft kit. And in that draft kit, while I'm reading for the next 30 to 45 minutes as things are exploding... <laughs> And explosiveness that continues to happen. Um, I like to read about your um, your philosophy, right? Your tears, your regression. One of the things that, and I know you really love evergreen content, and I and I think that's uh, I do too. But you like it because I think that it allows you to dig in beyond just player takes. I know you're not yeah. a huge player take guy. You have good player takes. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, it's Swami of Konami. I mean, that whole thing is it's just strategy right it's 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 philosophy it's how do you approach the game game theory stuff like that which i find fascinating and i think that it's constantly changing and evolving so one of the that's one of the best things that we can talk about is something that's pretty evergreen but also apply it to 2024 drafts mm -hmm. so before we get to team level regression which will lead to player level regression and some of the maybe some of the targets that uh guys that you're looking to either fade or uh or uh, uh or take this year i want to talk about just in general for 2024 what is your sort of roster construction philosophy or it doesn't even have to be 2024 when you go into a draft what is your philosophy if you had you know your pick of the litter if things went exactly your way how are you viewing drafts 
Yeah, I mean, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I try to approach fantasy football from, you know, a, a top down stance, you know, the game aspect of playing fantasy football. If you just rely on, you know, binary, you know, player decisions, right? Like, if you're, I'm just going to take the best player available. On you're just going to get a lot of those wrong, right? Like, we just get a lot of those wrong. We're bad at projecting individual players, but we are better at like at team stuff or building teams the right way. So that's how I try to always play. And I like do, creating content that way too, trying to teach people how to play. It's like, you don't have to always have like this firm stance of like, I believe this player is going to do this, this, and this. What if he doesn't, right? Like, you know, it's, you try to build teams around that. It all depends on your format though. And I don't want to use it as a cop out first, but like you have to always, you know, structure how you're going to approach fantasy draft based on, you know, first of all, your scoring settings, you know, what are your starting requirements? If it's a half point PPR versus, you know, full PPR and you only start two wide receivers, uh, that changes the dynamic between like running backs and wide receivers. Cause I mean, if you look at like last year and half point PPR guys like Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley, like they scored as many points as Puka Nakua on a per game basis. A guy like James Conner scored as many points as Mike Evans uh, in half point PPR, but then you get to like full PPR and you're like, Oh, DK Metcalf, you know, outscored in full point PPR, like the RB 10 and points per game. And you're like, Oh, like, so, so, so it, that all matters to what your scoring is, how many uh, starters you have, how many flex spots is completely like uh, on your radar too should be because if it's start two wide receivers, like say FFPC, it's start two wide receivers but it's full PPR and there's two flex spots. Like inherently wide receivers are, should be filling your flex spots in those leagues because they're going to outscore. So the running back. So it's essentially still a start four wide receivers in that league, even though it's masked as like a start two. Um, but you know, if you're in a half point PPR, uh, the flex spots could, are a little more nebulous, right? Like you have, you'll have to do tier breaks as you get moved down the line. Because like I said, those, those running backs, everyone's kind of leaving for dead, which is funny because underdog is a half point PPR, but it's best ball. So it's a little bit different mechanics because you don't set a lineup. It just takes your top score, but the half point PPR, like running backs have an edge, but an underdog, you, if you've drafted over there, you know, that there are running back might as well not even position on underdog. Nobody's taking them. So <laughs> it should just be a start 10 wide receiver at least because everyone's no taking wide receivers. Yeah. But uh, if I had my choice, though, you know, I play in a lot of leagues that are like, you know, full PPR, start three wide receivers, usually have like a flex, if not a couple. Those generally are more wide receiver driven. So I'm more of a wide receiver heavy drafter. I like to still my philosophy hasn't really changed. I think this year sets up to use this strategy in multiple avenues in a unique way this year as opposed to other years. And I've been more of like a hero anchor, anchor RB guy where you kind of, you know, you have your one bell cow running back, you surround him with a bunch of pass catchers, and you kind of just throw what you can at, at the RB2 position. You try to run into something along the way, a little diamond in the rough, or because ba baseline RB2 production is kind of the worst thing you can have in your lineup for those if it's just like face value. So you never want to just, like no one wants to draft the RB20 and get the RB20, right? Like you're like, you're like oh, I didn't lose that, but you didn't get anything really either. We want to be able to say like, all right, I just, threw my RB 35 at the wall and he turned into the RB 12, right? Like my RB 40. And it might not be for the whole season. It might just be like a six week stretch where like a, a starter goes down and you get to play him for that four or five weeks. And you kind of hodgepodge your RB two spot like that. Right. Where just like different guys are in and out of the, in and out of the lineup. And collectively you build like the RB one out of RB the machine parts, basically. Like you just try to put it together. This year's a little differently because you, you not you, in old ways, like old fantasy drafts, you would have to, always going to get that guy in the first round, right? Like you're drafting Chris McCaffrey, you're drafting, let's say in this year's stance, you're drafting Chris McCaffrey, Bijan Robinson, or Brees Hall. Then you're just drafting pass catchers for like seven rounds and then just throwing what you can at RB2. But because running backs got kind of pushed around and is a little more nebulous this year than in years past, and it might not be in your home league. You guys know your leagues better than me. Some still value running backs more than others. But a lot of leagues I play in, running backs gotten pushed down outside of those top three. So like, you can now start your draft with like three to four wide receivers and still get a high touch running back, which you never used to be able to really do because they would still be going in the second and third rounds. Now you can start three wide receivers and get a Joe Mixon. You can get a, potentially a Travis Etienne or go four wide receivers and get a Rashad White or, you know, get an Alvin Kamara or Aaron Jones, right? And that is like an, a way to anchor build differently this year where, you're still, where you still are probably in the first seven or eight rounds taking only one running back. But you're able to get a better running back now than you were in years past where, you know, you would just keep skipping it because you'd be in that prototypical dead zone where, you know, a guy like Zamir White might profile as, right? Like you would take your three or four wide receivers and the, the top running back available is like Zamir White.
And you're like, well, I ain't doing that. Like, you know, so there's a, it's, a, it's pretty fun. I think the way that running backs got pushed around this year has made fantasy really fun. I think we're going to look back at this year and see a lot of different strategies work. I think a lot of rules that people have kind of uh, gone by in fantasy football are going to get challenged this year. I think especially the older running back one, uh, especially because you're looking at guys like Derrick Henry. I brought up Kamara, Aaron Jones, Joe Mixon. Like we've got guys, Christian McCaffrey's the one on one, and McCaffrey's be pretty old. Yeah, he's, yeah. You, you, you know, we, I say old as a 42 year old. Uh, he's prehistoric he's, for an NFL running right. back. <laughs> but I think we're going to see that get challenged this year, and I think it's going to be able to be challenged pretty greatly through like roster construction. Because yeah, if you took Joe Mixon in the second round or Alvin Kamara, those guys, like there's a lot of risk there. But taking those guys in a potential where you're starting three or four wide receivers and getting one of those guys, it mitigates a lot of some of the opportunity costs that like it would have had before um, in terms of roster construction. Because if I get three or four good wide receivers and my Joe Mixon has 10 touchdowns, like that roster is probably going to be pretty good. Uh, you know, if it, Derek Henry probably doesn't slide as much as others. He definitely won't in your home leagues. But like there's a lot of running backs I think you can make a bull case for this year that are maybe pushing the spectrum. And some of them will fail and will say, yeah, the age cliff got that person. But um, even wide receiver, I think, offers some interesting fulcrum points this year because we have that kind of everyone has like a big top tier of like the seven wide receivers. And then it gets flat. And we've got a couple guys that like a couple oldies that no one wants to draft there too. Like nobody wants Devonte Adams this year. Like the dude's going to have 175 targets. Like, like no one wants Mike Evans after the year he had, like these guys are guys that are kind of like being kind of a little bit, they're not left for dead completely, but like they're like supremely kind of discounted this year, especially when we're doing so much projection for guys like Drake London and, you know, Alave, Marvin Harrison, like a lot of guys that's here. We don't know what's going on. Puka Nakua. Maybe you do. do. Do we even know what injury Puka Nakua has? I, I, they said he has a knee. I hope he has a knee. I mean, I hope he they does ruptured a sack. He I ruptured mean, a sack. What is it? That's his, uh, his bursa sack, of course. His bursa sack. I, his bursa sack is what it is. So, you uh, okay. You asked. I don't know if you really wanted to answer. I'm going to give you the answer. I, I, I'm answer. curious because I genuinely like finding information on like what's going on with him is like actually pretty sparse. So, he, so a lot of your joints have these, they're called bursa sacks. They're literally called bursa sacks. My, by the way, my algo, and I said this on Twitter is now a dumpster fire because so many people tag me and uh, ask me what a sack is. So that's been a nightmare as you can imagine uh, <laughs> with what shows up on my timeline now. But beyond that, when you look at the, the joint of a body, so you have this thing this external, uh, literally pouch like the sack. And what it is, is just sort of fluid joint fluid, and it helps the joint slide you know, smoothly. And so it, but it's quite literally fluid, right? Sometimes if you get crushed enough in a high contact sport, like football, then that thing can literally burst and it's super effing painful. It can swell up really bad, but it's not like one of those things that you're going to be, you know, debilitated for the rest of your career. So, um, Puka should be back by week one. I think he's going to be fine. So anyway, if you were asking, you were asking, so I want to be lying because like, he's been kind of, since it's been kind of, you know, no, it's hard to find a lot of information on like what his status, like what he's up to right now these days. Um, so I, I think you see, see him like he's trickled down in that same area too, right? Like, we, you know, if you have picked like 10 through 12 this year, it's a very tricky spot to navigate in your fantasy drafts because I think we've got like a clear nine that go off the board and then especially at 12, like, what do you do? You know, are you forcing now a Jonathan Taylor or Saquon? Are you going to take the, you know, are you going to take a chance on Puka? Do you double dip? Do you go wide receiver, wide receiver? Do you go running back, wide receiver? That's kind of where the fulcrum point is in fantasy drafts this year, like starting like pick 10 and then the, how you build that that roster out, you know, because that the wide receiver position is largely wide open at that point. And that, that's what makes it interesting. And then running back's already been wide open because we have – Christian McCaffrey and we have these two guys and Bijan and Brees who a lot of people are trying to say, well, these are the new Christian McCaffrey or, or next in line to become Christian McCaffrey esque. Uh, and then when you get to Taylor and Saquon, you start to have questions. You're like, well, they play with a mobile quarterback. Like, do they, you know, poach touchdowns? Do they not get as many catches because they play with a mobile quarterback? And it opens up. You even Jameer Gibbs, when he was there before the hamstring, he's another guy. You already inherently knew that Jameer Gibbs is sharing a backfield with another player. Like there was a clear gap. So Picks 10 through 12, like it, it's it's a little bit different this year. You're not getting like a bona fide, like tried and true, like throwback first that first uh, round kind of alpha player this year. It, there is kind of a, a cutoff this year. I think you mentioned, you know, a lot of the different strategies that you can deploy, but the 12, you know, the 12 spot, 11 spot being sort of a tricky fulcrum point. I, you know, what I think is interesting, and Rich, I didn't tell I'm surprising Rich because I, I, I didn't tell him I was going to do this. I pulled up your uh, 2023 
injury prone invitational draft results because I have the draft here on my sleeper app. And I actually think this is kind of an interesting exercise. Again, remember these individual players, the the ethos about them and the whole philosophy, this is not the same year, but you sort of mentioned some of the strategies that you implement. For example, last year, Rich, um, your draft, first of all, he Rich, Rich, you know, really got the end of the brunt of uh, you know, variance because he had a juggernaut of a team. I think he lost like two, three games all season, got to the championship round, lost to Michael Florio. This is in the, again, a super flex league. So we were just talking about that before we hit record. So it actually made me think of this initially. So you implemented last year, Rich, um, in the, again, this is super flex. So again, a little different, maybe than home leagues, but you were at the 11 spot. You went Justin Herbert the first round because quarterbacks were pretty much flying off the board in that first round as they do. And again, this is an industry draft. So, you know, very wide receiver thirsty, uh, all of us, I think we can admit. And of the thirstiest, perhaps, was Rich, one one Rich Rebar, who went four straight wide receivers after taking Justin Herbert. You went Diggs, Devontae Smith, which how the hell did we let that happen? How the hell did we then let the next round DK Metcalf happen? And then you also snagged Deontay Johnson. <clears throat> I was pretty annoyed because uh, at that point I thought Brees was going to fall. And this is where I, I learned my lesson, you know, signed, sealed, delivered. We're not going to get any these drafts and these in, the industry drafts. There's no value to be squeezed out of anywhere because then you took Brees Hall when I thought he was going to make it back to me over at the, at the second pick. You took Brees Hall, obviously a smash of a pick. Kenneth Walker, you waited all the way until another however many six picks that was to take your second quarterback. You nailed Brock Purdy, dude. That This is why you were the fantasy football GOAT. Um, and your team has been a juggernaut. You ended up getting Jalen Warren. You're, really, your only miss on this team was like Tank Bigsby, and nobody saw that coming. Um, so anyway, I mentioned all that, Rich, because you really did implement that year, you know, last year, that let's anchor quarterback is what you did, and you essentially went also anchor running back. So how feasible is that this year? How do you think you'll look at things, maybe in this particular draft this year, that that worked for you last year and might not work this year? Yeah, I said it, it's a little more open this year. I don't want to, and I never go into a draft saying I'm going to force anchor RB too. It just depends, you know, kind of how the draft falls. I think the the most challenging part of it this year is because I think wide receiver, like I said, flattens out, and I think it becomes kind of more of a a wild west scenario compared to where these running backs are falling. Like I look at, and he's gotten seamed up, but I looked at Isaiah Pacheco when he opened. Originally, Isaiah Pacheco was going in like the fourth round. And now yeah. he's like a second rounder in industry leagues, like Oof. absolutely a second rounder. I think you could even make a case that he's he should belong like near like Taylor and Barkley too, especially for the the ceiling outcome. Maybe we'll talk about the Chiefs and the team regression stuff. Um, but like he's gotten seamed up. Travis Etienne is like another guy. Like he's he's had one season where he was hyper efficient. Then he had one season where he was like volume driven. But we have a pretty good inkling he's a good player. Like when you look at like the the number of players that have started their career with like over 1,400 yards from scrimmage in each of their first two NFL seasons, like it's just littered with like running back hits. And that's something he's done. He's been a good. So like I definitely have a good feeling that like Chris, Travis Etienne's a good player. And he's like kind of getting some of the inefficiency stuff priced in. And you brought up Tank Bigsby. Like they didn't really do anything to change their running back room. Like Doug Peterson keeps saying he keeps saying he wants Travis Etienne to like alleviate his workload, but with who? Like they need they need someone else to step up. So maybe it's something that's more of a still of a pipe dream and doesn't really happen this year. Um, and that, that's the other thing too. If like Pacheco is like the Chiefs just have nobody behind him uh, at this point to push him. We'll see if they sign Jarek McKinnon in like the eleventh hour. Uh, well, like they they've, always um, do every they, year. They've done every <laughs> summer. Um, but like, you know, I brought up like guys like Mixon and Aaron Jones and Kamara. Like these guys are like available like later and later. Like. So there's just certain points you have to, I think you have to play the draft as it goes like in, in like tiers and just kind of measure like the availability of, so inherently if say like, it's just to say hypothetically, it's, it's three wide receivers, it's PPR, there's at least one flex. Inherently you want wide receivers in that format. But let's say I get to a point where like Joe Mixon's available and the top wide receiver is Jaden Reed. I can't do that. I can't take Jaden Reed over Joe Mixon. You know, I just can't do it. Even if like 40 wide receivers have gone like, so then you've got to calibrate to that. Like, and I will th then start to, you know, adjust. So I maybe have the plan that's anchor RB, but then something happens here where like the whole room took a bunch of receivers. And now I've got a clear tier gap where just like the running backs are better players than the wide receivers. And that's how I would use it to kind of like, you know, adjust throughout the draft and just calibrate throughout the draft. Um, because in, in your first round, your first two rounds, you got a good idea going in based on what draft slot you draw, kind of what you're going to start with. You, you got an idea at least like you, you might have one surprise pick 
that like pushes something around but like you got a good idea how like those first two rounds are gonna go like at least like in a strike zone where i'm gonna get like two of these six players basically and they're gonna kind of dictate how you move throughout the draft but when you're in the fourth and fifth round like things start to really shift and they really start to alter you might have to take a player around earlier than you thought you might have because of positional run you might have a guy then does a default around later and you also do got to be careful not to like reach in that capacity too um, you know, you do want to just have no wide receivers just and take best player available. So you got to, you got to adjust as it goes on. Um, that's the fun part of, of drafting though. That's the best part about auctions too. I mean, auctions are the, the best way to do it. You give everyone a shot at every player and then you can, if you have the time to do it, that's what a lot of people say they don't do them is they don't want to invest the time. But if you, you know, that that's when the teams get the most interesting though, is in auctions. So one of the things that you mentioned here was sort of looking at one position versus another. And that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, right? When you get into tier breaks, right? You mentioned Mixon versus who was it that you said Mixon versus I said like uh, Jaden, Jaden, for example, Reed, right, right. Table, right. Yeah. <clears throat> that, that seems like a, a pretty like, yeah, that, like that decision is pretty clear cut and dry. And I actually talked to Joe Dolan about this too. So when you value, for example, let's say tight end, for example, let's just say in this, you know, super flex draft, you get three wide receivers, right? And a flex and a super flex. Let's just, for example, let's pretend we're in this fairy tale world. We're in the sixth round. Um, somehow you're staring. You, you got, Let's say you have three receivers already. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you're staring down the barrel of Mark Andrews and Malik neighbors. you got a pretty decent, we'll assume you have a pretty decent wide receiver stable at that point because you went so many picks, right? We're in the sixth round. You're staring at Malik neighbors and you're staring at Mark Andrews. You haven't filled your tight end spot. What do you do in there? What's more so? I really, honestly, to a certain degree, don't care what you say. I want to hear what your thought process is. I yeah, care my, what you say. My thought process using the two players, the example and the team structure, I would take neighbors um, because, you, you know, just because you've filled your starting wide receivers doesn't mean you ha actually have. You know, you talk about like injuries, bust. We talk about getting, I want to play it as like, um, I'm going to get binary player takes wrong. I, I want to structure my teams that way. And so by me taking neighbors, not only is it insulation for myself in that format, it's also I'm pulling away a resource from another that another gamer inherently needs because you in that format, you need more wide receivers. And then the other part with the two players you specifically brought up in contrast is if Mark Andrews is available, I, uh, I'm pretty confident that I can just move down the line. And I, maybe if you're, you're trying to lead me into like the positional kind of, you know, takes here for like tight end or the, the, the onesie spots. But um, if, if Mark Andrews is still available at that point, then I know probably Trey McBride's available. I know probably George Kittle's available. I probably know Kyle Pitts is available, right? And so neighbors at, neighbors at that spot, what he represents for that format, what he would represent for my team, I believe would be a more valuable pick overall because I still would arbitrage a potential outcome of what Mark Andrews would give me while still needing wide receivers still inherently to, to fill on my roster. So that's how I would choose it. In particular, at tight end this year, I think it's a very hard year to be aggressive on tight end. You know, I don't think that we're one. I think it's great. We've been here before. I think that this is this position of tight end is as strong as I can recall it. And I know that we, we've said this before and it's Lucy with the football. It doesn't always work out that way. But I also think that the the way the talent is is now stacked at the tight end position because we had a really good class last year. We had Brock Bowers this year. We're getting more talented tight ends than ever in the NFL. Hall of Fame, Hall of Famer Ben Sinnott is in the league now. Ben Sinnott. Uh, Sorry, future, future Hall of Famer. Apologies. But also, compared to where we are as a league, whole in the NFL. So teams are playing less man coverage than ever, more zone coverage. I had to post this earlier in League Trends. The pre-snap middle of the field has been left open at a higher rate in each of the past four years. Um, and what this now in turn, applying that we have more talent and tight ends in the player pool, and defenses are kind of dictating that the ball should go to the middle of the field more, we've seen tight end targets go up each of the past four years too. Like tight ends are being used more. So it's like kind of a, it's a both thing. So, and then I look at kind of the little tight end landscape and I do have Sam Laporta as my tight end one based on career arc, what he did, you know, playing indoors in the team environment. He's the number two target on his team. Remember when you take tight ends, you want to be their first or second target on their team almost always. Um, and, and I look at it and I look at Laporta and I'm like, all right, but he wasn't even, he was the first tight end to be the PPR tight end one in overall scoring and not be the PPR points per game leader at the position in 30 years. 
So like he didn't provide any leverage, even though he's the tight end one. Now last year he provided leverage because he's a 13th round pick or like a 12th round pick and it, you hit a late round pick, but they, we had three other players produce 90% of the tight end ones output. And I think that it's just flatter this year. I, I don't see anyone doing what like Travis Kelsey did during his apex run where he's just like smoking the field and posting wide receiver one numbers. I see it just very tight. So I'm probably going to treat it a lot like I do like quarterback position. Like, yes, I would love Laporta if I caught value on him, but I'm not going to force Laporta because I could may maybe get Kelsey at value. I mean, if Kelsey's not a value, then what if where's Mark Andrews go? Then if Mark Andrews doesn't go, can I get Kincaid or McBride or can I get Pitts? Like, I feel like just playing at quarterback, I'm going to let tight end come to me this year. I feel very strongly about basically 10 of my top 12 tight ends the guys that have ranked at tight end one this year so i'm gonna play that just where the board lets me just like quarterback i mean i would love to have josh allen or jalen hurts but if i can't get them all right where does mahomes and lamar go is that something that's viable for my team is it a luxury pick for me based on the way the draft has fallen has quarterback been pushed down all right i can't get them where's anthony richardson going oh too rich all right where's kyler murray going ah still a little bit higher than i go all right well where's Jaden daniels going oh so someone's read all the articles they want Jaden daniels uh, all right, well, can I get Caleb Williams, right? Like That's how I think I'm going to play those two positions this year. I just feel very confident that that both of those positions are very deep this year. Okay, so now I know how to uh, structure the draft. I will I say the played. one difference for the onesie positions is if I was in a, a league, the Kings Classic at the in Canton where we got to hang out, and those are 14-team leagues. I will say, I do believe, especially at, at tight end, that you do want to play the onesie positions a little more aggressively as like your uh, uh, league size increases. That's when you. So I, I, I thought that was the opposite. So, oh, you could explain that. So uh, talk about that then. Because when you're in a 14 team league, my thought is, well, that just means that there are going to be, you know, the talent's going to be spread out. And, you know, a onesie position is, is even less important at that point. You need to fill your flex spots. You need to fill your wide receiver spots. And then you can sort of, like you were saying, use your tiers um, that, that, that are. Yeah, it all depends on how many onesies. flex spots you have. But yeah, I mean, like I, I think when it's more, I think I see both of those positions as congested this year. So in a 12 team league, it's just not going to get spread out enough to where I believe you're going to gain a lot of leverage on the field. Whereas, you know, say 14 teams, Let's say some of these guys bust. Let's say I feel confident in 10, six hit. So, but tight end, say tight end one through tight end six is pretty tightly packed in terms of scoring. You're not getting a lot of leverage, but on eight other teams in your league, you will have leverage. So on over half the league, you still will have that leverage. Whereas in a 12 team league, it's only half, you know, or, you know, it's, right, it's right. basically six teams. So that's why I'm a little more aggressive than that for Now, if you have like a ton of flexes and stuff, then, you know, obviously you gotta, you gotta arms race your way to the, where I'm those sure, flexes lines right. up and your scoring is it because it is when you're in these leagues that are like you know you got multiple flexes and especially if it's full ppr like you just need a lot of wide receivers because like i said most people get it wrong when they do like anchor or zero rb a uh, wrong is they just fill those spots like they get their starting wide receivers and then they stop and it, it's but you have to account for like i said injuries busts by weeks like you're going to get players wrong like you're just going to draft some bad players <laughs> like and, like you, you have to know that like you're just not going to you're right, not going right. to win that way so you got to keep adding Dude, wide oh my gosh <laughs> so i'm sorry we keep going i don't want to keep like derailing the show but when you say you're going to draft uh bad players i'm pulling the draft back up rich because man when i left that draft last year the one that i was just talking about your draft win i was like i won the league this is over. I'm going to beat all these analysts. I'm going to use their own resources to beat them. Here are the guys that I drafted, Rich, where I did not account for. I'm going to pick bad players where I did not account for. I'm, I'm uh, going to have some injuries. Um, I went Jalen Hurts. Oh, worked out fine. That was okay, right? Not bad. Yeah. Jalen Hurts, super flex league. All right. Gary Wilson. Oof. Tony Pollard. Oof. Mm -hmm. I know. I My next pick, one. Russell Wilson. Eesh. My next pick, Amari Cooper. Fine. My next pick, Alexander Madison. I thought this was going to be a juggernaut, Rich. So I didn't account for any of that. I didn't account for anything that you're saying. Last thing, because this is such a good conversation, I promise we'll get to the team level. Yeah, well, and go to the team level. that I drafted. Like you said, look at those guys all. I had you read off a bunch of injuries, but I insulated myself to hit to cover my to cover the pockets of you you know, Justin Herbert got hurt. Stefan Diggs was terrible the back half of the year. Deontay Johnson missed uh, five weeks early in the season, but. 
I drafted a structural manner to account for like the, the those things. I will say you drafted Deontay Hardy with your second to last pick. So ooh. <laughs> anyway, um, the rest of the team was a juggernaut. But anyway, okay. So I do want to one more thing, right? And I, I, I'll be we can be relatively quick with this one because I do want to get to the team and the player level regression candidates. You mentioned the mistake that some fantasy players make when they go anchor RB, right? So I'll, the mm -hmm. mistake that I've made in the past is I'll go anchor RB, but then I'll also try to do late round quarterback. Then I'll also try to do late round tight end, right? And I essentially end up somehow overvaluing the wide receiver position, right? So I, th I think that there should be like anchor RB strategy can work and right. So yeah. let's say you go anchor from a high level perspective, right? From a high level perspective, let's say you go anchor. How does that change how you go about the other positions? Is that when you use that leverage or you're going anchor RB that, and you know that you're going to go anchor RB to try to fill those positions? I don't want to say more aggressively, but you know that that's your strategy moving forward because you're going to anchor. Yeah, and it, like I said, I think it all depends on, you know, your, your draft, how the draft is going, the ebb and flow, like of where, how aggressively other positions are being drafted, kind of where you are on the draft board, all those things go into it. And that's kind of like the the, the beauty in, in the, the curse of our game, right, is that there is no absolute skeleton key. Like, I can't a a absolutely answer it. It's, like it's, it's kind of touch and go, and it's going to matter. And then the worst part is, I mean, when you talk about fantasy football, it's like all the different variations of – you know, who you play against every week matters, you know, just all these things kind of line up and create one unique league. Right. And that's, that's why it's so fun and so frustrating of fantasy football, right? Like it's, there is no skeleton key and we will never solve for it. And I try to play fantasy football that way too. I try to, I, I try to do like a North star. I make, I try to base everything I do objectively on probability, but also understanding that, that there's no hundred percent probability. <laughs> and exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. But that's how so, I always try to play. Absolutely, you you try to you try to optimize as best as you can, knowing that you're going to make mistakes and take your lumps, like me drafting Garrett Wilson and drafting Tony Pollard and drafting Alexander Madison. Uh, I'm not still. I still don't think about it. I still don't go to bed thinking about it. So it's not a big deal. So you did mention right leverage, right? You mentioned leverage several different times, Rich. And one of the things, another thing that you're really good at is looking at these high level concepts, like we were talking about. And when we look at regression, right? That's so important. I really do think that regression is one of the most undervalued, underutilized tools fantasy players have to their disposal, reading your stuff, reading stuff from JJ, right? Reading stuff at fantasy points, like all these, all these uh, statistical regressions matter if we're thinking in a prob probabilistic way. So this year, you know, you can list off one, two, three, however many you want that, it, that you think are the most relevant. Um, where are some regret, you know, what are some team level regressions that I think that you, th that you think fantasy managers may be overlooking or maybe, you know, counting too much, putting too much stock into. Yeah. And I do, I do a whole series on this, like a weekly series, kind of what I do for the draft guide on the site is every week I do like a different theme series. And I do like, if it's a, if it's an article based on positions, like it'll be each position each day. This particular series that I do for regression, it's a, a league wide kind of, you know, look at trends. And then I do really good, though. Really, you guys really should check that out. That's that's what my that one's free. Things. The league wide one is always free on the site. So you have a draft guide and kind of want to get a sample. Go check that one out. And then I do like uh, a drives like a drop performance per drive on each team. I do like a, uh, a red zone performance. I do a turning converting yardage into touchdowns. I do like a touchdown dispersal, which like we can get into. It's like the rate of like do you have more passing touchdowns and rushing touchdowns is like an anomaly, like in that sense. Cause th those are all pretty like unique signals to look at too. Uh, just to understand like how you can have some push and pull or like how, how even some the, those things like just skewed in one direction and created the season that like we saw just happen. Like when we'll, we'll talk about the Miami dolphins in a minute, Miami dolphins are a team like that. The first team though, that jumps out to me from like, when you hear the word regression, because remember regression is treated like a boogeyman, but it doesn't necessarily have to be like, the line teams like the Lions and 49ers are likely to regress this year based on the efficiency they had, but they still project to be some of the better offenses in the NFL. Like they can they can shave off uh, efficiency in context of what it was last year and still be good. Uh, so you don't have to run and hide from it. But like there is a team that does scare me that was hyper efficient last year, and I think has some pulling threads that absolutely scares me, and it's the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, and you look at last year, so. They were the only offense to score on half of their possessions last year. They led the league. They scored on 54.5% of their drives. They ended in points. Not only did that, was it the highest rate last year, only six teams in the 2000s have had a higher rate than that. Every one of those other six teams that, that were higher than them had a decrease in scoring rate per drive the following season. 
Uh, all of those six teams scored fewer offensive touchdowns the following season. Uh, four of those six teams had a decrease of touchdowns by double digits the following season. Uh, and then you look at it, um, what they were able to do uh, on a per drive base. There's, there's been only 20 other teams, if you want to expand it out and say, oh, this is a six-team sample. There's been 20 other teams to score 50% or more of their drives in the 2000s. Only four of them matched that the, the next season. They ran ultra hot in the red zone. Uh, they 47.7% of their possessions either reached the red zone or scored a touchdown before it, which means like you didn't, you bypassed the red zone. If you scored 90 yard touchdown, it shouldn't count in your red zone stats, but it should count as your drive stats, right? Like, cause you just skip the red zone. Um, and all, all of those teams, only 10 other teams at a higher rate than the Cowboys, all of those teams scored fewer touchdowns the following season. And you say, how did this impact last year? Right? Well, Dak Prescott led the NFL in passing touchdowns last year. He threw 9.7 passing touchdowns over expectation uh, based Holy on – I basically. didn't know it was that yeah. much. Oh, yeah. my God. He set career highs in pass attempts inside of the 10-yard line, 49, inside of the 5-yard line, 21. He had 67 pass attempts into the end zone last year. He threw the ball into the end zone 67 times. The next closest player in the NFL was at 53. Dak Prescott's previous career high before last year was 45 end zone passes um and then you take this for a league in league context over the past decade 53.4 percent of all passing touchdowns have come on throws into the actual end zone that, that you know so if you throw a passing touchdown 50 basically 54 percent of those have been passes into the actual end zone a guy caught it in the end zone he run it in last year the league rate was right on park that was 54.3 percent just you know one percent higher last year Guess how many of Dak Prescott's passing touchdowns were on throws into the end zone with all the stats I, like, I gave you? I, let me guess. I feel like I remember thinking he's throwing a lot in the red zone. Okay, I'm gonna say <clears throat> I'm gonna say 64%. 75% of his passing <laughs> touchdowns God. last year came on throws into oh the end my zone. God. And yeah, his previous high for a season was 56 and a half percent. So like, and then you, 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 you tie this to where I'm like, all right, well, there could be regression. There could still be, they could still have a bunch of pass attempts again, which they still could this year. But then when you look at the Cowboys, they are revamping this offensive line. They're kind of retooling these things. So the offensive line is arguably the, one of the most question marks under Prescott's career that he's had after CD lamb, they did nothing to the pass catching group that they trotted out last year. And if CD lamb were to miss any time, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about like him just not doing anything in camp yet. If that, you know, if he's, is he going to try to ramp up too fast? I, that's not my area. But if CD Lamb were to miss any time, like this offense looks awful on paper. Sure. Like it just, yeah. so the Cowboys, from a regression stance and from a like, when you look at their roster, they just screamed to me like hyper fragile. That's team. literally the, that, that's the exact phrase I was just thinking of. Yeesh. Yeah. So you're saying uh, keep your Dak Prescott bags light keep your well what is this and again maybe this is like trickling down to the question so let's say cd lamb signs tomorrow let's mm -hmm. say he doesn't ramp up too fast that's not a concern it's a bit of a concern not a big concern all right what does that say for cd lamb what does that say for the people out there who have taken him over christian mccaffrey who are taking him you know as the third fourth pick off the board where are you on CD Lamb? Do you feel like he's a hyper fragile guy? And where do you where do you rank him on the list of guys that you do or don't want based on that team level of regression? No, I still think that when you look at it, uh, Dak, even with all that regression, is still going to be capable. Like Dak's not going to turn into a pumpkin, but like from a fantasy stance, remember Dak doesn't run, so like you need him to throw those uh, touchdowns at a high rate over expectation because he doesn't run. He has to have a lot of passing touchdowns for you to get there for Dak Prescott in fantasy. But Dak Prescott doesn't have to be a great fantasy quarterback for Dak Prescott to be a viable quarterback for CeeDee Lamb. So, and we look at the Cowboys, like I just said, they, they did nothing to add to this. Like they're rolling Brandon Cooks back. And I know the word's been positive on Brandon Cooks, but Brandon Cooks is a post 30 year old wide receiver with two back-to-back -back declining seasons. Like these guys typically don't bounce back and become good again. Uh, it could happen, but I just think when you look at Lamb, he's going to get so many targets. And when you look at the back half of last year, he was just getting 12 targets a game. And just like, so the fact that he's just going to get, get so many targets, I think that it makes, it insulates his floor a little bit. Like we, so when you say this, like I feel very similar to Justin Jefferson about what I said, but his quarterback situation is just a little bit worse, right? Like Dak can be a mid range quarterback for fantasy football for himself and, and not, or, you know, and just, and have that be good for Lamb. But 
what if Dar what if Darnold's a bottom five quarterback? Like, what does that do? Does that make Justin Jefferson now more like Devontae Adams was last year? Because you know, Devontae Adams had 180 targets last year and he still had huge 20, 30 point games. They were just sandwiched behind like two or three games in a row where he would have like six or like he would have seven PPR points. And then he dropped that 30 and it was just kind of very cattywampus. You didn't, you didn't win games. You lose games. If you made the finals at Devontae Adams, he won you championships. But if you had Devontae Adams the week before, he had like four points. And so you might not have made the finals with him. It's all these, you know, like I said, the, the beauty of fans football, like points aren't scored on a bell curve. They're, they're hyper variant. They, they, you know, it's, it's a scatter, it's a scatter uh, shot. So Justin Jefferson, I think has a little more questions with CD lamb having very similar situations where like there's no target competition there could be there's the vikings are a team there let's just talk about the vikings anyways because they're a team that is going to have offensive regression in the sense that i said 82 percent of their touchdowns last year were passing touchdowns 30 of 37 in kevin o'connell's first season with the vikings it was 62 and a half percent um you know since 2010 77 percent of the teams that were above the league average and rate of passing touchdowns reliance came back the following season at a decrease the following season. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times you see the big spikes are just from teams that had low passing touchdown totals to begin with, right? Like a team threw 19, they had 19 total touchdowns, and like 12 of them were passing. But so the Vikings are in a boat where they actually had a lot of touchdowns. So like, they're going to come, they had 30 passing touchdowns. So if they fall down to like, say like, let's just say like 23 touchdowns or 24, is that going to be enough for Justin Jefferson to like kind of compete with the wide receiver one overall? I think it's in his range of outcomes, but I think we have to question it this year a little bit more than like CeeDee Lamb because Dak Prescott's just still better. A bad version of, of Dak Prescott is still better probably than the worst version of Sam Darnold. I think everyone would agree with that. And you have to price that in. Like, like I said, Adams is a great example of what he dealt with last year with Jimmy Garoppolo and Aiden O'Connell. If you watch the receiver show on Netflix, uh, you see the hell that he went through <laughs> last year. Yeah, that could absolutely. be something we live with Jefferson. I think overall at the end of the line, we're still going to see if Jefferson's healthy, we're going to see him finish as a wide receiver one in overall points, just like Adams did last year. But the the question will be the dispersal of those points. Is it frustrating? And you should still just care. That's why he's still a first round pick, but you might be looking at a Devonte Adams esque situation. Now, Darnold also can be a lot better than Aiden O'Connell and Jimmy Garoppolo were too, and kind of stave this off. That's why I said, I kind of think that's like the, the floor for Jefferson, but it still has to be priced in when you're counting like the wide receiver one overall. And I've have that thought about lamb a little bit in this context, just of a guy versus like, uh, Tyree kill, right? Like as a one for one, because Tyreek is the other guy when you look at versus lamb and Mike McDaniels just understood the the assignment with Tyree kill. I mean, he's been targeted on over 30% of his routes each of the past two seasons, the only wide receiver in the NFL when he's playing Mike McDaniels made a conscious effort to get him the football. And this is another team that is definitely do some regression positively in terms of like passing touchdowns. And, and like I said, we're expecting the Cowboys to have fewer. We're wild. expecting it because Tyree, imagine a better Tyree kill, right? That's but, unbelievable. Yeah. We're, we're expecting fewer passing touchdowns for the Cowboys naturally for all the things I said, but I'm actually anticipating more passing touchdowns for the Miami Dolphins. So you know, and I, I do want to say it. something, Rich. I'm, I'm going to interject right. because um, if you heard Tua's interview where he, he, this just happens to be he, with the same interview he took out Brian Flores, you know, that is what it is, whatever, a conversation for another day. But he also said, Tua specifically said in that interview uh, with, with Dan Lebitard that, you know, it was something like, and I'm paraphrasing here, Tua said, Jalen knew, Jalen Waddle knew we were trying to get Reek the 2000 yard season. Jalen knew that. Tyreek knew that um, and and Mike knew that and we were all Mike McDaniel we were, and he said we were all on the same page that we were trying to get Tyreek that 2000 yard mark so I don't what is that I don't know that's I know that's arbitrary I know that's sort of narrative driven yeah. a little bit but uh, you know what do you think that says based on what you're saying from a regression standpoint let's say that is another five percent you know extra target share that goes from Tyreek to Jalen Waddle um, overall obviously the pie with more touchdowns like you're in, like you're insinuating obviously the pie gets bigger but I don't know what you do with that information or if you do nothing with it well, like I said, we have another year, the year before that, like, I'm not, I'm never counting on a guy to get 2000 yards. So like the fact that they're pushing for that doesn't really factor in because I can just look to the first year they had Tyree kill too, and see how he used him then too. And it was just, like I said, he it's back to back years over a 30% target rate. This is a team that from the, you know, from the Shannon entry, they don't run a lot of 11 personnel. It's going to be a condensed target tree. It's going to be Hill 
and Jalen Waddell, and then probably a Tanner Janu as like the next, like probably guy in targets, like on the team. So he, he can give a little bit to Waddle and still have like an overall share of a pie that's just still ginormous in terms of the actual, you know, context of wide receiver ones. But you look at Tua, he was seventh in expected red zone points last year, but 16th in actual points scored. He set Oof. career lows in passing touchdown rate inside of the red zone and career lows. Not like they, they were talking the floor his years and the, 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 we thought he was bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and he and he threw his lowest uh, touchdown rate and throws inside of the 10 yard line. His previous career rates were 29.6% touchdown rate in the red zone and then 45.2% inside the 10 yard line. Those rates last year were 24.6% in the red zone, 296 inside the 10 yard line. And that trickled right over to Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill was third in expected red zone points. He finished 16th and expected point scored. Now Tyreek's a guy that can make up some ground because he's got a trump card. He's got a spade. He can score from 80 yards away. Not a lot of guys can, uh, but just 16% of his red zone opportunities resulted in a touchdown. It was the lowest rate of Tyreek Hill's career. Uh, you know, that rate was 27.3% his first season in Miami. So a 10 over a 10% drop is pretty precipitous. His career rate entering last season was 28.8%. So not even did he just come short, like he significantly was different for it. Uh, had a big drop off. Well, guess who benefited from all of those things that I just said? Mr. Devan, Devon H. And, and Raheem Mr. Mostert. Mostert. The yeah. two mm-hmm. running backs that just had all those touchdowns last year. Uh, 47. 22, right? For Mostert or something like that? So they crazy. were 1 2 in red zone points scored over expectation. Raheem Mostert, 47% of his PPR points came directly from touchdowns. 47%. Not only was that the highest rather share. High. Yeah, that they got half. That not only was it the highest share last year, it was the highest share for any fantasy running back one over the past 30 years. <laughs> and and you know, we're seeing this price in. Like everyone understands regression for me most of it. You see his ADP, right? Like everyone gets mm. this. Uh, but we don't really know if it's if it's how this is gonna impact Devin Devin A Chan. Uh A Chan was 10th in red zone fantasy points scored, he was 31st in expected points. Interesting. He had he had just 12 total touches last year inside of the 10 yard line, but he scored on six of them. Uh, he also only had six opportunities inside the five. Five of the six resulted in touchdowns. These are both the highest rates uh, in the NFL. So I don't like this. I don't like where you're taking this. I really don't like no, where you're going with this. Richard. No, because when when I tweeted out something because uh, about the stat where Devin A. Chan and Raheem Mostert became the 10th and 11th running backs to score on over 8% of their touches. Uh, guys that had over 100 touches in a season no one else every any previous player that's done that hasn't scored more touchdowns the following season now with most that's no one expects him to score 20 so big deal but like HM, you know he if he goes from nine to six touchdowns like that's kind of a big deal where his adp is now i think he can make up some ground he's getting more overall touches this year he's just going to have more touches this season so more yardage he's going to circumvent potentially loss of touchdowns with just more yardage gained and i do think he's a really good receiver um, and I know you, you know, you guys at fantasy points have, have some great nuggets on him too, when he's lined up in the slot. So I do think he's going to get utilized in the passing game to kind of mitigate some of this. I don't think you're going to bottom out. I know that some people think he's like a boom or bust fantasy pick. I think he's going to make up some ground, but I do think that Devin Achan has a chan ve- has a, has a thinner path to being like the RB one overall than some other guys, right? Like I think Pacheco has like a, actually a higher, higher odds to be the RB one overall than Devon Achan. And I think that a lot of people wouldn't take that at face value, right? A lot of people wouldn't believe it because he's so explosive, right? He's like the Tyree kill of running backs. So, you know, it's super, super cool. Um, but I do think that Miami's going to, the Miami backfield in general is going to just have a, a, a top down recoil in rushing touchdown value while inherently there's more passing touchdown upside. Also, one other thing to keep in fact with the Dolphins is game scripts. You probably, a lot of people, the Miami Dolphins were dead last in the NFL in fourth quarter dropbacks last year. What? What? what is that? Why were they leading that much? Yeah, because they because they were ahead so much in games. Like so, they're gonna they're gonna be a team that just has you know inherently dip, you know tighter games, and they're gonna have to throw more this year based on game script. I mean, there's a couple of games where they just absolutely molly wop some teams. Obviously, everyone remembers the Denver game. But uh, you know the, the the Jets are going to be better this year. We can talk about the Jets too. They're the uh, they're the inverse of like what we've talked about. Uh, <laughs> right, positive right, right. regression. The people like the the game. Well, well do you do you want to go that direction or do you want to go the maybe there's no maybe maybe there's nothing no 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 noise there no signal on the Chiefs. 
Oh yeah, the, so the Chiefs. Yeah, uh, the Chiefs are a team that I'm definitely looking at as like, and I'm counting this into part of my Pacheco take as well. Uh, last year, Chiefs were ninth in the NFL in rate of drives to reach the red zone, but they were just seventeenth in the NFL and turning their red zone drives into touchdowns. Uh, it was only the second time since Patrick Mahomes has been the quarterback, the chiefs can view, converted fewer than 60% of their red zone scores in the touchdowns. Last time it happened was 2019. The following season, the chiefs came back and scored 53 touchdowns the next year. Uh, they were ninth in the NFL and expected touchdowns, but actually finished 15th in touchdown scored as a byproduct. They were 26th in touchdown scored below expectations last year. It's the first time in the Mahomes era, they actually finished with fewer touchdowns below their implied team total. Uh, this is the cheapest that basically all the Chiefs have ever been. Mahomes included four fantasy football since he has, since he exploded. Uh, his that that breakout year was that he, he's not never going to be that cheap again. But this is the cheapest he's been in, in fantasy. Uh, outside of Pacheco is the cheapest Kelsey's been since he's been on a run. They the wide receivers are kind of nebulous. Like no one knows really. No no one is fact. People have been factoring like the a potential suspension for Rice. Now he's starting to climb up because it looks like he either might not be suspended or it's be later in the year. Obviously Hollywood Brown got hurt, but Xavier Worthy is cheap. Like all the receivers are cheap. They have so much more speed on this team that's actually viable because Valdez Scantling's fast, but like he was just fast. He's just a fast human being. Mount Justin Prince, Watson yeah. is a fast human being, not a good wide receiver. Now they have right. fast, good wide receivers uh, on the roster. And so the the Chiefs, I try to leave a fantasy draft basically with a Chiefs wide receiver, just a dart on any of them. I don't try to reach for them, but I try to leave with one of them because someone is going to, someone's going to pop there. And I keep going back to the same thing. I've had this talk with Scott Barrett. What if just like all this speed that the Chiefs are adding just make Kelsey and Rasheed Rice, the guys we know from last year, like even better? Like they just clear out and like the middle, they, the Chiefs are just destroying teams in the middle of the field with Kelsey and Rasheed Rice because you have to respect Hollywood and you have to respect Xavier Worthy's speed now because it's not Justin Watson and Marcus Valdez-Scaley. So my question is, you know, you mentioned Isaiah Pacheco having RB1 upside. Now I know that the Chiefs don't throw as much when they get down to the red zone, when they get down even within the five or the 10 yard line. I mean, the Super Bowl winning touchdown was a throw after all. I mean, we're talking about Andy yeah, Reid. Yeah. So they do what goofy do you stuff do? down there, man. They do goofy stuff. What do you do with Isaiah Pacheco and his touchdown equity then? In that yeah, case? you're going to live with that. They're going to do some Kadarius Tony end around or some lineman throw or ring around the Rosie. They do this all the time. Like you're going to have to live with a few of those touchdowns, but the overall touchdowns, the overall amount of touchdowns the Chiefs could potentially score are, I think, enough to get him to like the double digit, potentially even, you know, like maybe even like the 15 ish range. Um, because he's going to catch so many more passes this year, unless they do add McKinnon to the end. I mean, this, this offseason has been kind of a disaster for the backfield. Like, CEH has dealt with some injuries and then he's, he's dealing with kind of, I think, you know, um, some depression, some PTSD, he said, and stuff. So, like, you know, always you have to respect that, you know, everything he's gone through. Like, I mean, it's, playing football is hard. And CEH started his career with a lot of expectations and he was hurt a lot of his rookie contract. There's another place in the multiverse where it was a good draft pick and it worked out. Like it, it fit and it, it, it did it in this iteration that we're in. Um, so it's easy. You, you forget these guys are human beings too. They have expectations for themselves. So like when they disappoint, it's, it's, it, it weighs on them as well. But you know, they're, they, they started out like the Eric Prince. Is he going to like take over and like be like a threat? And then they, he didn't really do nothing. And they're using like Carson Steele's like a fullback now as like the RB two in these preseason games. So like all the signal is like, we're going to see like this just immense workload at any time we've had, well, first of all, anytime Isaiah Pacheco has had even 70% of the played 70% of the snaps, he's been, he's like gone nuclear. But Andy Reid running backs in general, like when we've had, and it's not just guys like J Jamal Charles and Kareem Hunt and Brian Westbrook. We're talking guys like Damian Williams, Daryl Williams, Sharkandrick West, Spencer Ware, Corell Buckhalter. Like anytime these guys have got to be the lead back, they've been just fantasy dynamos. So, I mean, a, a lead back attached to Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, like, I mean, give me the base rate. I'll take what you're going to give me. This is fair. This is fair. <laughs> now, real quick, because I've had you here 53 minutes now, and I it's been fire. Don't, no don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. 25 minutes. It's not, Let's no. go. <laughs> well, I mean, no, I just want to let you go because I think this I is short change super you. valuable. No, I appreciate it. So, but you did mention then one, one more AFC team here, the Jets. Now... I will say that as this as the offseason has gone on, preseason has continued to move forward. 
and I'm usually not, and I hope you know this about me by now. And I think the audience does by now. I'm not an injury alarmist and I'm not into predicting, thinking I can predict injuries, you know, well, there, I'm, you're I'm not on that side. When you have something skew in this direction. Right. So my question here, well, my thought, my concern here is Aaron Rodgers. Um, calf strains are very possible after an Achilles. He came back pretty fast, probably did a lot, probably too soon to be 100% honest with you. Doesn't quite look right in camp. If you see him in videos, I mean, there is a, there is a universe where this does not work out for a 40 year old coming off and a kill. Oh, absolutely. That, I think, I think that there's more, you know, I would, again, if I had to assign arbitrary numbers, I would say it's somewhere in the 10 to 15% chance that something happens to Rogers and that Achilles in that foot again, or that Achilles in the, in the, in the calf again, to where even if it's not worst case scenario, right, it's four games, six games, something like that. What we saw with Joe Burrow at the beginning of the season last year. So I, I know I should just set you up to basically talk about what happens if the Jets aren't with Aaron Rodgers again. I, that's not the, really the question yeah. I have. I guess I want to look at both sides, right? Let's right. say he does have a full blown season. Uh, a, a full season plays every game is relatively healthy. What does that look like from a regression standpoint? If we can try to predict that. And then again, because you talked about insulating yourself so much uh, before with some of the things that we're talking about with, with draft strategy, right? What do both of the, what, what do both sides of the coin look like for a guy like Aaron Rodgers if he's healthy? And then if he's not, yeah, and uh, I think you have to consider this too because up until Tom Brady, we had never even seen a four-year-old quarterback be good in the NFL, like let alone like coming off an Achilles, right? So like Aaron Rodgers, you know, it, I would say if any if any any NFL player were to open a spite store, it would be Aaron Rodgers. So maybe he's just that, like that spiteful, like he's going to refuse to fail. But what I think that makes the Jets an interesting conversation here is they have two guys that are being drafted in the first round. Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson. And then there's just a huge gap. I actually was going to frame it the other way. Cause like you, you have with those first round guys, we're playing for one outcome with Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson. Like there's no, like you need those guys to smash where you're taking them. But what if this, like re the regression analysis, like the run out is for these other guys. What about T Tyler Conklin? What about Mike Williams? Uh, you know, what about those guys? They're just kind of being left for dead. We're pricing in. We're doing this a little bit with the Falcons where Drake London's getting priced versus Kyle Pitts because people are sick of drafting Kyle Pitts. But the Jets, we're factoring in. We're like, all right, well, Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson, we know these two dudes are good. They're talented. They're going to take off. And we're pricing that in. But how come we're not pricing anything in for any other Jets players? And I get like the Mike, where are you at at Mike Williams? I haven't heard like the injury prone Mike Williams. I have a guy. I haven't fully delved into it, but he's a guy. He had the ACL tear in week three last year. Um, is he? He's not yep. definitely mm -hmm. behind the. He's not behind the eight ball like to the degree of like Chubb or Jonathan Brooks. No, no, he's not. He should be back by week one. They'll probably slowly build him back up. He's going to be like ten or eleven up. months by the time they get there. The thing about Mike Williams, and it really comes down to what your opinion is of him as a player. Most wide receivers after an ACL tear, unless your name is you know Julian Edelman, unless your name is Jordy Nelson. Most of those guys, they don't even hit 90% of what their production was before. I wrote in the guide there that um, basically, you know, I think 90, I, I don't have it in front of me. 90% of Mike Williams is something in the neighborhood of like 12, 13, half PPR points per game. I just, unless Aaron, unless Aaron Rodgers throws jump balls to Mike Williams. Yeah. If he throws jump balls to Mike Williams every single time they're down in the red zone. Okay. Then he'll have some, he'll have some upside, but I just don't see, especially off of that ACL. I don't see and at 30 years old. And then one more thing, you know, Matt Harmon's reception perception. We see that if they, if play, the players who have had success in their first year, and we're talking like blown their ADP out of the water success after an ACL, they're, uh, they're, reception perception numbers against zone uh, average out to be 80 percent and mike williams pre acl was 78 yeah, percent. he's 30 years old uh, yeah that's not his game so again all those things unless he gets you know 20 30 jump balls from aaron Rodgers in the season i just don't see the upside that's my sort of player take on mike williams but like you said we, we get those wrong all the time so i mean listen you're just just saying to take conklin uh or take shots on you know xavier gibson or I that's doubt right malachi corley is going to be a thing but um, but I mean, literally when I was doing that, that series on like the team regression stuff, it just became like, a un uncovering the, the next stat in futility for what the 2023 jets were. <laughs> I mean, th th this was like an all time bad offense. And obviously everyone kind of yeah. knows that on the face value, but hearing some numbers around it, it makes it even worse. Um, just 33% of their scoring plays, 18 of 54 scoring plays. They had 54 scoring plays, by the way, last year. But probably a lot of people wouldn't say that. 
uh, you know, were the result of getting into the end zone. It was the lowest rate of any team in the in the 2000s. The previous low was Arizona all the way back in 2005. Uh, again, small sample. But all those teams improved the next year. They converted only 32.4% of their red zone possessions in the touchdown. So not only did they not even reach the red zone, they, when they got there, they were terrible at, at making it count. Uh, th that was significantly lower than the, the next closest team then, but it was also the worst rate for any team since 2010. Only eight teams uh, in the 2000s have had a lower red zone conversion rate than them. Um, they averaged a touchdown for every 253.7 yards gained, the worst rate since the 2012 Chiefs. Uh, only four teams in the 2000s worse than, worse than them in, in that too. Like wow. all time, all time bad. The one all thing though bad. I will say about the Aaron Rodgers thing is they've added Tyrod Taylor. And not that I'm saying Tyrod Taylor is going to be like the dude that saves everything if Aaron Rodgers misses time, but it's not Zach Wilson and it's not Tim Boyle on Black Friday, the blackest of Fridays. Uh, that was the darkest of Fridays. Wasn't that the who wasn't that the pick six game at, yeah. at halftime or what was that? The Hail Mary. The Hail Mary pick six. Yeah. Hail Mary pick six. Yep. It, and so like Tyrod on a Giants team that was as almost as equally as bad as the Jets last year. Good you had good New York football last year. But Tyrod actually right. from a from a, a yards per play basis when Tyrod was on the field for the Giants last year. They were a, a, a middle of the pack offense in yards per play. They got dragged wow, down yeah. to the shadow realm by Tommy DeVito <laughs> and when Daniel Jones played. So Tyrod at least is functional. I will say that if the yeah. Jets have to go to the what's happened the past two years to the Jets, where they have to go into the bag of quarterbacks, they at least have a player that's functional <laughs> compared right, to what they right. put out. <laughs> yeah, it was it was bad, man. It was it was like um, and I remember everybody screaming at them. And uh, at the time, I was still with the twins at the time. I actually had a conversation with my assistant GM, and we just I just asked him like you know, you're the Jets, right? Let's say you're in the Jets position. And we had that conversation. And he's like, I mean, you're making calls to X, Y, and Z. And you're, you're thinking about this, this, and that. And like, but the takeaway from the conversation was like, you're making a move. And they just never made a move. And then, I don't know, that's a whole, again, that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. Sorry, continue, Rich. No, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the end of it. It is frustrating to see like, because I mean, we don't have 32 good humans playing quarterback on the, on the earth right now, let alone to have like insulation for backups. But there are just teams where you just scratch your head and you're like, why are like like Ryan Tannehill's out there? Like who like who you you know not, not taking Ryan Tannehill to be a starter? Maybe he's waiting for someone. Maybe he's in. We don't know behind the scenes. He's waiting to see if there's an injury or something, and he's a chance to start. But like someone go get Ryan Tannehill. Like these good teams, we've seen that like these guys, these, the quarterbacks get hurt. Especially now we've gone to 17 games. Every year since we've gone to 17 games, more quarterbacks have started than the year before. Like you, you have to do better than what some of these teams have had as backup quarterbacks. Um, it's just so bad. So I bad. will say the, I did do, I, I uh, went back and looked at the numbers on quarterbacks and I published this at fantasy points. This was like in April or something, April or May. And um, what we did see was a, we actually saw a very similar percentage of quarterbacks go down uh, in terms of injuries. And, the thing was, though, we had more quarterbacks go down that missed like six plus games. Mm. So, you know, the Joe Burrow, you think of the Joe Burrows, you think of the Aaron Rodgers, you think of those guys who missed those those guys who played uh, like one game or two games, three games. And that was really where you saw the spike in injuries. And like you said, quarterbacks uh, sort of. Yeah, because uh, the backups are replaced. so bad that they yeah. don't hold the backup job. Like, you know, you look at like DeVito right. was a good example, right? Like, well, Tyrod got hurt afterwards. Then like, well, we're going to play DeVito. And DeVito was so bad. They're like, we can't play DeVito. We got to play. Yeah, him. Right. Exactly. And exactly. That's what the, exactly. The, the Jets found them in the Jets. Like they, they're like, Zach Wilson's bad. He's so bad. We're finally going to let Tim Boyle start. And they're like, oh my God, he's actually worse than Zach Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> like, we got to find someone else to play. Because yeah, because they're the, the these backup quarterbacks aren't good enough to even sustain holding the job. So teams throw more stuff at the <clears throat> at the window here. Right, the Browns exactly. did it. The Browns started uh, DTR. DTR was absolutely they awful. He then they were like, good. "Man, we'll just get PJ Walker." I'm like, this is not working. What are we gonna do? They're like, "We'll call up Joe Flacco. He's on his couch." Like, yeah, it's the same thing, man. Like, <laughs> right, right, exactly. But that's what you said. One season, the longer injury for a quarterback actually led to multiple like one injury led to like three different quarterbacks playing <laughs> right no yeah exactly <laughs> exactly it's been wild it's been wild all right rich this this has been really good man really valuable i always i always enjoy having these conversations with you um what where do you want the people to go where do you want the people to find you 
what do you want to push here? Yeah, sharpfootballanalysis.com. You can go check out the draft kit. I actually submitted my last article, How to Draft Tight Ends. I think I gave a little bit of it away here on the show. But yeah, sorry. you did a little, little uh, sneak peek. But you can always go back to, if you don't have the draft kit, you can always see, like, there's always, a, every week there's a free portion of the series. So whatever series you're interested in, there's a, one of the articles is always free. So you can go back and at least read on, uh, you know, what, 25% of the work I put out for free if you don't want to buy a draft kit. But I encourage you just get a draft kit. Go get a draft kit. It's it's 30 bucks. The draft kit is $29.99. I know most of you degenerates spend more than that playing baseball. I know more of you degenerates spend more than that on Amazon. Go spend 30 bucks on the draft kit. Make sure you follow Rich on X Twitter at Lord Reeves. Rich, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. We'll catch everybody on the flip side.